three students. One conversation where film theory collides with the reality of filmmaking. Life after film school. Today's guest, John Landau, producer of the 20th Century Fox release, Avatar. Your newest film, Avatar, written and directed by James Cameron, is about a disabled former Marine given a chance to get his legs repaired by going to work for a corporation on a distant planet. Now, he remotely controls a genetically engineered biological body called an avatar to infiltrate the native population in order to make it easier for the corporation to access a valuable mineral. Now, James Cameron actually wrote the script way back in 1994. So when and how did you first get involved with the project, and why did it take so long to get production up and running? First of all, that's a movie I want to see, the way you described it. That was well done. Um, no, you know, Jim did write Avatar in, in 1994. Um, at the time, it was always a passion project for him, and he did it partly at the time to push Digital Domain, a company that he had founded, that he was on the board of, in the direction where he thought visual effects needed to go. So he wrote this story and then felt that the technology that would be needed would be what the industry would use down the road. Digital Domain read what Jim wrote and said, you're crazy, we can't do this. <laughs> so really, we put it on the back burner. But throughout the years, it always lurked in the back of our minds. So people get confused, and they, they hear that, and they think we were waiting for 3D technology. But that's not what we were waiting for. We were waiting for the technology for the close-up. Then when we saw the work that uh, Peter Jackson did with Gollum, it sort of reinforced, hey, maybe there's more. Maybe we could even push it a little bit further. In 2005, we were on the verge of, of going into production on another movie, potentially, and uh, we were just looking at the landscape, and we felt that, gee, if we were the impetus to push technology, now might be the right time to do Avatar. The performance capture is one of the talked-about technologies of this film. I mean, it's, it really captures the emotion of the character's face, like you had said, versus, you know, more traditional motion capture, like Polar Express, movies like that. Why do you think it's so important to kind of see through that technology and really capture the emotions of an actor's face, you know, for compelling storytelling? You know, I, I think the stories are based on what the actors do. And there, there's a reason they become stars. We have an affinity with them, and they're the ones who really let us into their souls. I tell people that motion capture in the past was always missing one very key letter in front of it, an E, for e-motion capture. And that's what we really wanted to try and, and, and do. And we have uh, amazing footage of, of Zoe Saldana side by side with what she gave as the performance and what her CG character is doing. Yes, you not be happy. You will never be one of the people. And it illustrates the point that we made to the cast when we t convinced them to do the film, which is CGI can now be the 21st century version of prosthetics. No longer do you have to go into hours and hours of makeup. It's you giving that performance. And it allows us more creative freedom in the design phase because prosthetics is additive. Prosthetics can only be built up. What if you want the mouth smaller? What if you want the eyes slightly further away? You can't do that with prosthetics. So for us, we, we went through the process and we were doing performance capture. We also added onto it what we call virtual production, where Jim Cameron actually held up a virtual camera it wasn't a real camera, it wasn't photographing anything. But when he looked at you, he wouldn't see you, he would see the CGI character that you were playing. And when he moved his camera around the barren stage we were on, he wouldn't see the stage, he would see the world that they were in. And not fully realized at a photographic level, but enough for him to get his signature shots, enough for him to work with intimacy with the characters to make sure he got the performance they wanted. Sigourney and the rest of our cast found this technology very liberating. I think, um, you know, she said, number one, it, it, we gave her more to work with than when she does a stage production. Because when you do a stage production, you're playing it out to the audience. Here, she could play it directly to the actors that, that she was working with. It gave her the freedom of, of knowing that if she nailed the performance once, we can use it multiple times. We can use it in a close-up. We can use it in a wide shot. There, there was also no big overhead to, to the shooting cost, so she could experiment more. She could go out there and take chances because we would just say, let's go again. So Because when we're doing performance capture, you're not waiting for lighting. You're not waiting for camera rigs and crane setups and all these other things. The moments are all about performance. 
So I think the cast would come in for a performance capture day and know that the focus was all on them. And they, they gave us a lot more. This is video log 12 times 21, 32. Do I have to do this now? Like, I really need to get some rack. No, now, when it's fresh. Okay, location, shack, and the days are starting to blur together. So for the lead role of Jake Sully, you cast Sam Worthington. Now, this was before he starred in Terminator Salvation, so he was considered to be virtually an unknown. This seems like a big risk for such a huge production. What did he show you during the casting process that proved he was the one? Well, the key with any casting process is finding the right actor for the right role. And Sam, we saw a screen test that he did for us down in New Zealand, and we said, wow, there's something special there, and we flew him over. And even though it took us a while to convince others, as soon as Jim met him in, I want to say, June of, of 2006, Sam was always Jim's first choice for the mm -hmm. role. And the film also features Sigourney Weaver in a major role, as you said. Mm -hmm. And she, of course, played Ellen Ripley in Aliens, another film by James Cameron. So as I'm casting my own films, how important is it to have a group of actors that I can rely on to use again and again? Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, I think Jim certainly has used quite a few actors over and over again, not because of the relationship, but because he really feels they're the best actors. Sigourney was not the first person we thought of for that role. We thought it might be a role she wasn't even interested in, and we started looking at other people. And then we realized, like, what are we doing? It is the right type of role for her if she'd entertain it. So you just figured you'd come out here to the most hostile environment known to man with no training of any kind and see how it went? And she brought such a great perspective to everything. Not her experience with Jim so much, but just her experience in the industry. And, and I think she had a great influence over Sam and over Zoe and, and the rest of the cast we were working with. Now, going back, let's say, to the, to the pre-production stage, you did an, a gargantuan undertaking in that you literally researched, created, and developed the entire flora and fauna of the imaginary planet Pandora, and then you created your own language. Well, maybe you think it's imaginary. It's there. It exists. <laughs> And why was it so important to, to sort of delve into these details and really well, expand it? You know, first of all, we believe that, you know, films need the detail to create a believability. For the audience to go on the journey with Jake Sully, they have to believe that the world he's going to exists. And to go there and to have no explanation for why an alien population speaks English, that's a problem. So we have a backstory that uh, Sigourney Weaver, Grace's character, created a schoolhouse and tried to teach them English. So only some of the Navis are capable of speaking English. Well, if they're not all capable, we need to create the other language because there's key dramatic elements that they have to talk to each other about. So we hired Paul Fromer, a professor at USC, to write the language for us. And what was very fascinating to me is I thought you'd give him the, the words you need him to transcribe and he would come up with words. He spent the first six months defining the structure of the language before ever really translating anything. On Nari. 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 We put the same challenges on our design team. So when they were when designing the creatures, whether it be Stan Winston Studios or Neville Page or these other people, they brought to it the same sensibility. So they would create a character or a creature for us and say, well, look, I've now created a way it rests, this little fly that we call a hellfire wasp. When it lands on a tree, five of them land together in a flower shape camouflaging themselves. So this is something that the artists themselves brought to it, and it built up a foundation for us to, to go from. Thanks. Right. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. Best of luck on Thank everything. You. Thank you and so you. much.